right, I see it's 3 o'clock. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, How to Help Older Adults Recover from Disasters, developed by the Gerontological Society of America Disasters and Older Adults Interest Group and supported by the GSA Innovation Fund. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website. A notice to all attendees will be distributed once the recording is available. A question and answer session will immediately follow the live presentations. We will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the GoToWebinar panel. Also located on the GoToWebinar panel are two downloadable handouts, case vignettes, for today's program. Excuse me as I wait for this to advance. There we go. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers, Dr. Lisa Brown, Professor and Director of the Trauma Program at Palo Alto University in California, and Allison Gibson, Assistant Professor in the Department of Social Work at Winthrop University in South Carolina. Thank you, Lisa and Allison, for being a part of this important program. So we can all know just a little bit about who's in the audience. We'd like to take a quick poll. Please tell us who you are by answering the poll that appears on your screen. We'll keep this poll open for about a minute to allow everyone time to answer. And I see people posting. Now we'll give a couple more seconds here. Okay, let's close the poll now and show the results. Here they are. Okay, without further delay, I'll hand the microphone to Allison. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, so I appreciate everyone turning out today. I think this is um, obviously a very important and timely topic. As Judy mentioned, I'm based out of Rock Hill, South Carolina. And uh, we uh, just recently had our 1,000-year flood around this time last year. And I'm sure many of you are aware from watching the news that we are currently anticipating another uh, major disaster uh, at the end of this week with Hurricane Matthew set on course to hit our coast a little later. Uh, so I really appreciate that you guys uh, take an interest in this again just because I, I think we are going to continue to see some needs with our older adult population around this topic. So our goals for today, we're going to be talking a lot about older adults as a special population, what makes them unique, what makes them a population that we really want to spend some time taking a look at and talking about. We're also going to be looking at this in talking about how workers identify needs and assessment following a disaster and what the community does to intervene post-disaster. We'll also be taking this uh, uh, conversation to a broader perspective and looking at both uh, how we care for these folks both in facility, long-term care, as well as community dwelling older adults. So I know Judy mentioned those vignettes. If you haven't had a chance to check those out, those are a great resource. We're going to discuss them more in depth a little later, and we hope you'll be kind of thinking about that as we continue the conversation today. So in kind of thinking about some of the uh, recent disasters that have been going on here in the United States, Judy, if you wouldn't mind advancing for me, uh, we are going to be talking about, um, again, what ultimately happens following a disaster. So I know many of you are probably aware that we had some substantial flooding in Baton Rouge just about uh, this time a uh, month and a half ago. For the folks that were in this area, we saw some substantial flooding where many folks had to be evacuated from both their community settings as well as long-term care facility, uh, uh, long-term care facility settings. Excuse me. And uh, I can tell you as a Red Cross volunteer that I just recently saw this last week that they were sending out requests for folks to continue to deploy down there. There's still facilitation needs within kind of managing those shelters. We still need to provide some crisis counseling. We still need to have some client casework done. So even though this flooding even happened six, seven weeks ago, we still have some significant needs within this community, um, still need some immediate disaster recovery from this flooding right now. Uh, the Louisiana flood of 2016 was also considered a thousand year flood. So it was caused um, by a substantial kind of rainstorm that happened in less than a 48 hour period. So the rain came very quickly. Many folks uh, may have had kind of a warning that they were expecting some rain, but they may not have had the awareness that they really needed to kind of get out and, 
um, and get out quickly. Uh, that, that accumulated very, very quickly. And so from this flooding, we do know that 13 people ultimately lost their lives. Over 100,000 houses were flooded there in Baton Rouge and the surrounding areas. And um, we know that tends to be that many older adults sometimes can be affected by this. So uh, since uh, Hurricane Katrina, which was in 2005, we have seen a lot of conversations come out across um, academics, researchers, policymakers to start talking about the importance of that we need to improve care and response services for the older adult population post-disaster. Uh, and so we are starting to, I think, do a lot better in that, in that we're meeting some of the needs of this population a little bit more effectively. Uh, we're continuing to kind of work to address some of the challenges that come with the older adult population, um, but despite all these efforts, we still continue to see older adults disproportionately affected by uh, these disasters, and that, that has definitely been seen with some of the recent data of hurricanes, flooding, um, all kinds of different events. So something that I always think is really interesting when I talk to my students about this idea of age, um, age is not necessarily what makes a person vulnerable. Uh, a variety of factors make it more or less difficult for older persons uh, to be uh, effectively recovered after disaster. These uh, different factors can uh, be things like an individual having impaired cognition, limited mobility, having some declined senses that accompany many times folks aging. It can also be due to things like folks having challenges being alerted to uh, the impending disaster, being able to prepare effectively to evacuate or seek shelter. We also see older, older folks have a decreased social network or lack of available social support if they are more isolated in their living arrangements or if they're living farther away from maybe family members. Older adults often have fixed incomes, and so as a result of that, they may have limited financial resources to help them in either evacuation or even returning to their, their state of stability after the crisis. Uh, we also have things like mental or medical problems, acute chronic health conditions, uh, folks have medications needs, they also have things like medical problems, needs for oxygen, so there's all kinds of things that are ultimately going to affect their ability to successfully uh, evacuate or uh, relocate if needed, as well as to do things like access safety. So as we kind of uh, think about some of these things, um, you may even think about some of your own family members that you have had firsthand experience with or maybe even clients or other uh, patients that you uh, have treated or worked with over the last uh, uh, year or so. Think about these folks and think about some of the needs that they might have if they were suddenly and abruptly having to relocate or move to a new position. Um, oftentimes when we specifically talk about this current cohort of older adults, we talk about this issue that many of them are not uh, super interested in having maybe some conversations around well-being and mental health. So many of these folks may be unclear on exactly what crisis counseling or therapy can and cannot do for them. They may be more uh, limited in wanting to have discussions around that because when they were growing up, it was a very stigmatized conversation for them to have. Uh, so they may be very hesitant to reach out for behavioral or mental health services following a disaster. So again, older adults, they're in, at an increased risk for adverse consequences. Uh, these are folks that are going to be much more likely to have adverse outcomes in the wake of the disaster compared to that of the general population. Again, not just because of their age, but because of some of those factors that often accompany older age as, uh, as they kind of move through their lifespan. So there are a number of issues that I kind of already started to mention uh, previously that ultimately affect folks when they're recovering post-disaster. And so as professionals or even concerned family members, friends, it's important for us to be familiar with some of these issues so we can start to think about how we might be able to get folks uh, the support and access that they need. So during a disaster, um, community services are often not available. Uh, you know, folks may shut down services temporarily. They may have to evacuate themselves and their families on their own. So we have situations where folks may need to um, get access to things like medication or medical care, and some of those resources may be uh, limited, even for folks that are residing in like a long-term care facility. There's often limited communication, um, though I will say that we are starting to see more efforts to support that, especially through the use of social media. That's been a growing area that we're seeing uh, 
help to improve some of the challenges with communication, but historically communication has been a major issue, especially with our older adult population. There can also uh, be damages to folks' housing, their facilities, the community in general, and that may also kind of force folks to be relocated and relocated for extended periods of time. Um, I try to think about, you know, my great aunt who is a snowbird who goes down to Florida um, uh, every so often. So you, sometimes she'll come down to South Carolina and Charleston. And uh, when she's in those uh, extended circumstances, you know, there's all these different medical providers that she goes to see. There's all these different folks that are responsible for her care. So being uprooted from that, even when she makes the choice to go down and enjoy her winters in some of those warmer areas, uh, that can be a, a particularly challenging thing to navigate. And that's a very intentional and planned process. So imagine folks when they're not having these planned processes, how that ultimately kind of affects them in these situations. Um, so we also know that uh, population can experience behavioral health needs or trauma as a result of a disaster, so that's going to have some major implications for folks, as well as there can be financial impact, and I've previously mentioned those fixed incomes um, really limit folks in, in what they're able to do should they have, you know, a long-term expense related to staying in a hotel or having to purchase all new food, all new clothing because of what they've lost from a disaster. So that can have some pretty substantial impact on this population. So while that's all being said, all of these issues that gen generally tend to affect older adults, we also know that older adults tend to be very resilient. Uh, they're oftentimes um, very capable of evacuating their home or facility without any issues. We also s will see folks that um, are older that tend to serve as first responders or volunteers in helping a community recover from a disaster. Uh, so they also can have, provide a lot of support and, and uh, resources to our communities as well. We know that people react in a variety of different ways when responding to disasters. Professionals agree that there's no one healthy pattern on how folks are supposed to react following a traumatic event. Um, but these are some of the different kinds of reactions that are typical for folks. Some folks appear uh, to be greatly disturbed following a disaster, especially when they've had a traumatic event, um, while others will throw themselves into recovery efforts or other activities, showing very little emotion or concern for what has just happened. Um, so we all have different ways of coping and kind of responding with that, and that's true for older adults as well. Neither type of response is necessarily better than the other. It depends on the individual. Most people will experience some signs or symptoms of trauma-related stress after a natural or other type of disaster, but whether a person experiences these stress systems, um, symptoms immediately after the disaster or later on, it is important to recognize them and help folks cope with their feelings. We want to connect them with someone they can talk with um, so they can talk about their feelings. Sometimes that may be you as the individual. You may know that that's a role that you can fulfill within your community. Other times that may mean that we need to connect them with another uh, type of professional that's available. Um, even when a person's response to a disaster is very traumatic, it's also important to remember that they are reacting quite normally. One aspect of stress reactions that can be most upsetting to the individual is the belief that no one else is experiencing what they are. So as much as we can to help folks kind of realize that this is a normal response, normalize this experience for them, that's going to do wonders in terms of folks kind of uh, being able to kind of cope with what's all going on. So for those of us working in our communities or working with older adults or maybe just have some family or friends that we're generally kind of consciously thinking of, it's important for us to be able to be aware of these type of reactions and have a general understanding of the recovery process. Even if you yourself are not in the role to be able to do things like screening for, you know, traumatic reactions, setting up shelters, uh, having an awareness um, of what individuals and um, communities, how they go about recovering, that's going to greatly impact uh, everyone in a positive way. So when we identify needs, we are often are trying to triage those who we are most concerned about. So there's typically kind of three groups that we take a look at. That first group are those that are well-functioning. Uh, they really don't need any type of immediate assistance, and so we're not going to be too concerned about them. There's also a second group that's often kind of acutely distressed. Uh, they're exhibiting some temporary um, kind of reduction to their functionality. They're a little bit impaired because of what's just happened. Um, we're going to help them get what they need and move on their way. And then we also have those that are kind of more dysfunctional uh, as a result of kind of what's happened. So they may not currently be, but they may be kind of starting to move in that direction. And so these are the folks that tend to need the most support, and they're going to need to be the ones that are considered the priority. Uh, they're the ones that we're going to want to make sure really get connected with some professional support if that's not us providing it. 
So for those of you that might be screening older persons after a disaster, there's a few important considerations that I think are helpful to kind of think about when considering older adults versus those that are maybe um, from other age groups in our population. Uh, after disaster, it's important to know biological, psychological, and social needs of an individual. Use of a cognitive screening is recommended when we're assessing an older person who appears very confused or maybe what we deem to be a little too quiet. So screening for cognitive impairment such as dementia or delirium may also be necessary, especially if an individual is there alone. You don't have a family, a friend, a neighbor, or someone that can talk a little bit about that individual, their history. Um, I, I can tell you firsthand from uh, talking with folks when we had our flooding last fall, uh, that is a, a really big challenge when folks show up by themselves and they may be a little disoriented because of some of the trauma. So they may need a, a little bit of time to be able to kind of cope with what's going on around them before they can begin kind of some of that process. Uh, assessment of trauma and related symptoms should also be kind of routine in these screenings. So I know Dr. Brown will probably talk a little bit more about some of the tools and things we uh, use beyond that for post-disaster, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about that just yet. I'm going to save that for her. Um, but I often find that after I've spent some time with older persons, I've built some rapport with them, um, I'm able to hear a little bit more about what's happened and how that's making them feel. Older adults often uh, fail to report or minimize any of their traumatic experiences. So if I can, I can give them a little bit of time to kind of get used to me, feel comfortable with me, if I have that luxury, um, I want to be able to provide uh, them feeling a little more comfortable with me before they may share that they want to tell me about that. Um, and some folks, you know, we don't want to uh, require them to tell us that kind of stuff, but if they feel the need that so they want to share that, um, I, I want to be there to be able to kind of listen and support some of that. Um, older adults may also want to focus more on their physical rather than emotional symptoms. Uh, that's very common, and again, that I think has to do with maybe uh, this cohort where uh, it's you know it's, we're not ones to talk about our feelings, we're not very emotional. Um, so so that may be kind of a, a specific thing that's common with this age group. And then we also want to make sure that we're doing some suicide assessment, especially when we're talking about older males, uh, just because they are a population that we are particularly concerned for uh, due to high risk of suicide. There are some recommended special considerations when we're providing um, support and treatment for older adults. Patient is really important. Allowing some extra time to be able to listen to concerns. Uh, that's going to be really important. A lot of people, again, want to have some rapport with you before they're going to jump right in and kind of talk with you about some of the stuff you're trying to gather from them. Make sure you maintain eye contact with the older adult and be at their level. So if I'm speaking with somebody that's in a wheelchair, I want to make sure that I sit down with them so we can look eye to eye to one another. Again, normalizing those reactions, that's going to be really important. Uh, make sure you're, you're, you know, you're regarding folks in an unconditional positive regard. So do not appear to doubt or disbelieve in a person's account of what happened, even if it sounds absolutely you know, ridiculous or impossible that you know, the water came in and took, took up in the way that it did. Um, that is, that's ultimately not the goal at that time. So uh, again, kind of to be supportive, to help um, kind of talk with them about the, their feelings, their immediate needs, that's going to be maybe more appropriate at that time. So. Uh, I usually try to um, get a little bit of a brief synopsis of what's happened in the immediate aftermath because oftentimes we are, are needing that to know where they came from, what they need, uh, but I don't try to, we don't want to push that too much out of them. We want to uh, be respectful that they may need a little bit of time to kind of just even to process in their own head what all has just happened. So with that, I, th I believe we're going to um, talk a little bit more, too, about this idea of intervening as we move forward. So a cookie-cutter approach does not always work with older adults. We can't just stamp out that everyone needs the exact same thing. We need to kind of talk with folks and kind of start to identify what those immediate needs are, how, you know, how is their well-being, how are they thinking about things. Um, and we also need to take into consideration that a lot of this is based on where the individual lives. So um, if they're in a, a community setting, if they're in more of a facility setting, this may really dictate the level of support they need, uh, the settings, the resources uh, that, that may be most beneficial to them. So at this time, I believe I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lisa Brown, who's going to talk with us a little bit more uh, on this topic. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Um, not surprisingly, the place where an older adult lives influences the level of care available and received post-disaster. 
Let's consider the vignette describing Mr. Baker, a nursing home resident. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to download the two vignettes and read them. For those of you who have not read the vignette, Mr. Baker is a 74-year-old widowed African-American man who lives in a nursing home that's located in an area where an uncontrolled wildfire is occurring. He is evacuated with his wheelchair because he had a stroke one year ago that affects his mobility as well as his expressive speech. He has difficulty communicating with others. His two grown children do not know that a fire has resulted in an emergency evacuation of the facility. In the emergency shelter, Mr. Baker appears confused and disoriented. He does not seem to understand the imminent wildfire danger. He is tearful and attempts to verbalize his questions and concerns to anyone who will listen. As a staff member, what are your concerns? And so as we go ahead, I want you to think about Mr. Baker during the remainder of the presentation. Physical safety of Mr. Baker is our first concern. We want to make sure that his medical care is not disrupted and that he has the ability to take his medications as prescribed. The emergency facility he is evacuated to should ideally be a like facility. That is, another nursing home, care, nursing home that offers similar levels of care to their residents. However, Mr. Baker may have been evacuated to a public shelter or a facility that does not offer skilled nursing care. Under these conditions, it is optimal for Mr. Baker to have staff at his home facility providing ongoing direct care in this new environment. Staff who know Mr. Baker well will be most knowledgeable about his communication abilities and most likely to be able to meet his needs. In a chaotic environment, staff who are familiar with Mr. Baker should be better able to detect the presence of delirium or medication problems before the consequences are serious and potentially life-threatening. It is not uncommon for residents to have to evacuate post-disaster from their facility because of structural damage that occurs during the disaster. We know that some residents report feeling depressed about losing their home if they are not able to return to their facility. Disruption and loss of relationships with staff can choose. Although, although research we conducted on the effects of evacuation on nursing home residents revealed increased rates of morbidity mortality, and hospitalizations post-evacuation among residents with moderate to severe dementia. No studies have determined the optimal ways to conduct evacuation, and therefore, unfortunately, no guidelines to minimize adverse consequences are available. The losses and disruption caused by relocation has enduring effects for some residents but not all reactions are negative. Some residents actually reported feeling excited about the evacuation and all the activity. It appears that people with cognitive impairment have the worst outcomes because they can't fully grasp what is happening. Now let's shift our focus from institutionalized older adults to those who live in the community. Not all community dwelling older adults are healthy their home counterparts. With greater emphasis on keeping people in their homes in response to their desire to not live in assisted living facilities or nursing homes, many older adults have elected to have home health aides who provide some level of daily or weekly service in order to remain in their homes. However, during a disaster, home health aides are often not able to provide continuing care because of transportation issues or family demands. This subpopulation is understandably at risk. What many of us fail to appreciate is that the older homeowner who has aged in place may actually be at greater risk. The person who receives home health care is on an agency list, whereas the independent community dweller is not identified as a potentially vulnerable adult. A homeowner who has aged in place also may be surrounded by younger families in late life and is no longer a social member of the neighborhood unless they belong to a religious organization or a social group that is aware of their needs. Our next vignette features a caseworker with a heavy caseload of 45 clients. Post-disaster, the caseworker is struggling with a variety of issues such as knowing the location of her clients, what their current needs are, and how to provide assistance. Consider her challenges as we review, as we review the next few slides. Older adults who are physically able and independently functioning but are married or living with a person who has a physical or cognitive impairment 
will encounter the same type of challenges recovering from a disaster as their less capable partner. Moreover, most disaster responders are not well trained in crisis and aging issues. So for example, crisis counselors, they have extensive training on kids and healthy adults, but limited exposure to aging information. Additionally, nursing homes and assisted living facilities typically don't offer behavioral health post-event. So under the best of circumstances, mental health treatment is limited, and after a crisis, uh, crisis counseling is even more difficult to obtain. It is well recognized, though not well addressed, that older adults are the subgroup of the population that is least prepared for a disaster. Lack of preparation contributes to poor outcomes post-disaster. Moreover, outreach for services may be limited after a disaster. Older adults are less likely to serve as self-advocates or request assistance even when it would be beneficial. Peer-to-peer -peer programs are often a good solution for helping people recover when resources are scarce. If older adult volunteers are provided training, they can assist others who may fall through the cracks. Older adults may be especially vulnerable to cons post-disaster. Uh, the media reports of people being taken advantage of during home repairs and insurance scams are accurate, but results in a situation where it is difficult to discern who is trustworthy and who is not. Many older adults report being overwhelmed by extensive paperwork and by the number of people they need to deal with during the recovery phase. The cost of repairs may make it impossible for many to recover their losses and rebuild their home and lifestyles to pre-disaster stages. These financial stressors result in physical and mental health consequences that go unaddressed. The importance of social support cannot be overstated. Not only the number of people, but the quality of relationships influences post-disaster outcomes. Knowing that you are not alone, that others are willing and able to help can be a very important asset in the recovery process. In addition to media alerts and scams, if you work in a facility that provides care to older adults, be careful when dealing with the media. Rescue photos often show older people in an unflattering light. Try to protect vulnerable people during and after an event. Watching a traumatic event repeatedly can worsen mental health outcomes over time. Encourage people to turn off the TV and use their informal social network as a, social, as a source of support. For those of you who would like to learn more or become more active in this area, I encourage you to consider joining the GSA Special Interest Group, Disasters and Aging. My co-presenter, Allison, is the chair of the Special Interest Group and leads a very active and involved group. The presentation today was sponsored by the Disasters and Aging Special Interest Group and financially supported by the GSA Innovation Fund. The next two slides show additional resources on this topic that can be located online and downloaded at your convenience. And we now have uh, a few minutes available for questions. And please use the question feature on the right side of the screen. Thank you, Lisa and Allison. Um, on behalf of the Gerontological Society of America and the Disasters and Older Adults Interest Group, thank you very much for your participation today. I'm just giving everyone a couple of seconds to locate their questions feature on the GoToWebinar panel. Just a reminder that we are recording the session and we will send you an access link by email once the recording is available. Um, and you will also be able to download a copy of the presentation slides from today. And also know that a webinar survey will automatically launch after the webinar. In an effort to, uh, for continual improvement, uh, we would like to hear your thoughts. So uh, please do provide feedback by clicking the survey link at the end of the webinar after the question and answer session. So you can type and send questions in the questions feature in the dashboard. You'll find that on the right-hand side of your screen. 
while we're waiting for a question to come in, um, I can uh, share with you that uh, I think that it would be most helpful to designate trusted authorities within a given community that an older adult can turn to for um, counsel and advice about how to deal with insurance and how to deal with the recovery processes that oftentimes um, somebody who is a designated authority is not identified prior to an event and post event it's it's difficult to uh, determine when you're trying to coordinate multiple services in the recovery process and so a central location with a clearinghouse would be an optimal solution to older adults who are basically um, not taking action because they don't know where to start. We do have a question here. Is there any data or advice for minorities? Um, there is um, data on um, minority populations. I think the, um, the data that has been most um, robust has indicated that neighborhoods, um, and I'm thinking in particular of New Orleans, that were not rebuilt post-event, that they suffered losses um, because uh, for many of them, they had lived in their homes and neighborhoods for um, decades, if not you know, generation after generation. And as a result, when you lose your social network, um, those losses can be particularly, um, particularly really depressing and, and really contribute to um, adverse outcomes. Um, people who are relocated from other areas into communities that don't have um, a strong uh, base for them um, to get reestablished also encounter additional issues in terms of um, integrating into a new community. So I think um, the, the information that's now coming um, out. Also, there was some interesting literature on Vietnamese populations and some of the issues that they encountered. And I think primarily it's focused at this point on, on how people will get reestablished if they're forced to relocate and also the lack of, um, the lack of preparation, how that affects them um, in terms of the recovery process and that we need to do more to provide supports to those who don't have transportation or the financial ability to uh, obtain adequate safety and shelter. Great. I have another question. Can you discuss risk for PTSD in older adult disaster survivors and sources for further research? So, Allison, do you want to take that one, or do, would you prefer that I? Um, I, I, I'm assuming you can hear me right now. I yes. think, Lisa, you may actually be best suited to speak to that. That's definitely not an area that I have done a lot of work in myself. So, I think, I think with, um, I think one of the nice things um, that the literature shows is that people are remarkably resilient. And there are those who definitely um, show um, signs of, of needing more assistance than um, a natural recovery process. And so psychological first aid is typically offered in the immediate aftermath of a disaster in public shelters. So if you're going to a like facility or going to another type of environment where they don't have Red Cross workers or Medical Reserve Corps workers, the likelihood of you getting psychological first aid as a standard intervention is pretty low. And psychological first aid is akin to medical first aid. It is intended to either offset the need for more intensive intervention later on or to keep you um, safe until you can get more formal intervention. Um, for those who need more assistance, um, crisis counseling is um, the next step in terms of treatment. Um, we know that uh, people who are um, more likely to have strong reactions to a disaster often have um, had previous experiences with human-caused trauma. Not so much natural trauma, but if they're prisoners of war 
or if they're Holocaust survivors or if they've been involved with a history of uh, interpersonal violence, that they're um, far more likely to be um, vulnerable and to experience um, difficulties um, in the recovery process. And we also know that um, older adults that have a much smaller social support network and that are socially isolated tend to have um, unique challenges in the recovery process. Uh, I think that, again, um, outreach where we have a peer-to-peer -peer, um, response. Uh, there's agencies that are uniquely uh, poised like seniors in service where they do visits to homebound older adults that are isolated can often sort of uh, mitigate many of these issues. And that um, last but not least, um, older adults are more likely to present with a some syndromal pattern of PTSD symptoms meaning that, that um, they may not have all of the necessary symptoms to be formally diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, but just because they don't meet full criteria for the disorder as, as um, specified by DSM, uh, it is still important to uh, treat that person because just even one or two of those symptoms in and of itself can be very distressing very debilitating and adversely affect functioning on a variety of levels. Fantastic. All right. If there are no other questions, um, any remaining thoughts or um, ideas to share with the group before we close the program today? Allison, I think you should <clears throat> share with them a little bit what you're doing given where you're located right now and, and what you're uh, contending with. Sure. So as I mentioned, I think many of you heard that Hurricane Matthew is headed towards uh, South Carolina. It's expected to hit our coastal region. Uh, I believe now Friday morning is the most recent update that I've heard. Um, I think it was originally supposed to be Saturday, but we're now talking about Friday morning. Um, so I'm at a, um, a small teaching institution uh, up in Rock Hill, so we're nowhere near the coast. Um, but the conversations that we're having uh, right now, at least on campus, is um, we are preparing, I think, to bring in some students from coastal Carolina to actually stay here at Winthrop. Um, we're going to set up a shelter in place for students that um, need to evacuate that campus but maybe are not at a place where um, they maybe can go home because their families are, are coastally based and they're all evacuating that region as well. So we've got kind of a mixed happening where there's some a couple regions that are really close to the water that are uh, mandatory evacuations. And then we also, um, our governor has called for even some areas like Columbia, which is very centralized in the state, to evacuate as well, just because, again, that thousand-year flood we had this last year, if it, if it was to experience some substantial rain, um, we are concerned about seeing uh, flooding, and we still have not fully repaired and recovered from that, that last uh, event. Uh, this time, actually, last year, I was just sharing, I just realized um, the lecture that I gave today in class is the same lecture I had to record this time last year because um, we had students that were affected and out uh, from that. So we, are, we have all kinds of exciting things happening on campus today uh, in preparation for that and then families, parents especially being concerned, what is our plan here? If we were to have power outages or flooding, how are we going to take care of, this, of the students in the dorms and in the surrounding community? So uh, lots of exciting things happening at Winthrop today. So in closing, I would like to um, Thank you, Allison, for sharing, but I, I'd like to um, point out the fact that with our changing demographics and with uh, existing lack of infrastructure for um, research and programs proactive for uh, disasters and older adults, I, I think, unfortunately, that um, we're in a, an area of growth. I think that the demand for uh, people who are knowledgeable and trained in all disciplines is going to increase over time. Um, and this extends from people who are um, working in the areas of policy um, all the way down to volunteers working in the field and providing um, like psychological first aid intervention. 
I think personally, um, my um, efforts to establish the special interest group at GSA on um, older adults and disasters was really uh, fostered by my recognition that um, there are um, publicly funded programs that are ongoing and uh, functioning that address the needs of um, children and adolescents and trauma and that are um, well supported and um, well coordinated nationally. Um, a similar type of um, program is not in place for older adults and historically the types of funding and the types of resources that have been made available to this population are done post-event by people who have recognized that um, unusually large numbers of them have died as a result of a disaster. Typically, you know, 70 to 80 percent of a population that dies is over the age of 65. So I think, again, just encouraging your involvement in um, GSA and the special interest group as well as um, encouraging you to pursue your own lines of research and um, to try to strengthen the types of programs and services we have to offer to our older adults. Terrific. If, if I may, a closing question then. Um, can you share ideas on how long-term care facilities could practice or prepare residents for a disaster in a supportive way? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, I think that um, oftentimes um, discussions with residents don't take place soon enough. That, that when I look at the type of burden that is placed on um, staff that work in long-term care environments, that typically the days spent, um, and I'm thinking now specifically about hurricanes because that's where Allison's got me in that mode, although I now live in uh, uh, California, so we're more earthquake focused, but where you have some sort of a window where you know that you're going to be evacuating, um, trying to talk to residents before staff get extremely busy. So for hurricanes, we have a situation where the days leading up to the time that they're actually ordered to evacuate, staff is busy readying the facility to be able to shelter in place. And once they receive the orders where they have to evacuate, then they have to prepare to evacuate. So they're actually involved with a two-step process in many instances. So they're pretty tired, understandably, by the time they actually hit the road and then coming back. So I think that the demands on staff are really incredible um, for um, disasters where there's no advance warning like an earthquake or a fire. I think, again, that um, you know, having ongoing um, residents and staff alike both benefit from drills. I know that with people with mobility and cognitive issues, that's often a real challenge and really difficult. But I think that, um, that sometimes um, when staff are really stressed um, and don't have enough um, resources to asking residents who, have cog who are cognitively intact, what their comfort level is in terms of assisting one other resident who has some mild level of impairment but would benefit from having a companion during a period of chaos and transition um, would be a good way to keep um, able residents busy in a meaningful way and at the same time soothe and manage residents that um, would benefit from having that kind of interaction and that would take time away from staff who need to attend to other tasks. So I guess my, my, my main point is, is just to, the more you can be proactive as opposed to reactive in your efforts, um, I think that there's benefit in doing so. And a lot of that will depend on your administration sharing that view, but if they buy into it and are willing to allow you to do in-services with staff and have some, of, some sort of a resident board where they can talk about this issue, I think those are all things that contribute to a good outcome. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Lisa and Allison, for your wonderful presentations today, um, and thank you everyone for uh, uh, chiming in and dialing in for today's program. This is the end of the webinar. Thank you.
Thanks, y'all.